Finally, to the last, the left, uh, Professor Cummings is Professor Stephen Ramirez. Uh, he is currently a professor of law at Loyola University Chicago and the director of uh, the Business and Corporate Governance Law Center at that law school. Now, Professor Ramirez joined the law faculty at Loyola University Chicago in July 2006. He came to Loyola from Washburn University School of Law, uh, where he was the founding director of the Business and Transactional Law Center. Uh, pri prior to joining Washburn's faculty, he was a partner with Robinson, Curley, and Clayton, a Chicago litigation firm specializing in corporate securities and banking litigation. He also served as a senior attorney for the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation and as an, as, and as an enforcement attorney with the SEC. Professor Ramirez teaches business organizations, securities litigation seminar, and other business-related classes. He has published extensively in the areas of law and economics, corporate governance, and financial regulation. Uh, so we Hello, have everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, I want to thank the University of Utah for having me out here again. This is the fourth time I've spoken at this excellent law school. And I want to thank Dean Johnson for putting, putting together a, a dynamite program. Um, on the other hand, as you can see from my title, there is a certain surreal element to the discussions that we've had uh, thus far, with the possible exception of what you just saw from Drake Cummings, uh, in terms of what austerity is really about and what caused austerity. Uh, one of the things that I think there's universal agreement on throughout this program is the desperate need that we as a society have for economic growth, which with economic growth, the debt burden, whatever it may be, goes down. With economic growth, unemployment, no matter what it may be, goes down. With economic growth, we have more resources to address pressing environmental concerns, ranging from energy problems to too much carbon to climate change. Uh, with economic growth, we have more resources with which to educate our youth to attack all those problems. So I don't think we can overstate today or yesterday the importance of sustainable, long-run economic growth to the well-being of our society. And I think there's universal agreement on that. But what you haven't heard anyone say, I don't think, throughout this program is the following. What if it turns out that the people who hold the most power over our economic d destiny really don't give a hoot about economic growth? What if the most powerful people in our society could seriously care less about economic growth? Think about it. Say, uh, my name's Steve Ramirez, and instead of being a law professor at Loyola University Chicago, I have successfully installed myself as CEO of Chase Sachs, <laughs> right? And I'm sitting in a big office in Manhattan overlooking New York City, and I'm making, oh, let's say 50 million bucks a year. When you add up my bonus, my private jet, my health benefits, you know, the whole nine yards, deferred compensation. And if I get fired, the board members, and by the way, if I'm CEO of Chase Sachs, you're looking at my board. It's all my pals, right? My cronies. Uh, uh, if the board members fire me, that's not such a bad day at the office. I mean, as a law professor, if I walk into the office and the dean says to me, Steve, you're fired, you know, I'm in big trouble. I got real problems. I had two daughters in college. Uh, I got all kinds of problems. My creditors have even more problems, but I got a lot of problems. But if you're CEO of Chase Sachs, you don't have a problem when you get fired. That's a great day. We saw all kinds of CEOs exit the executive suites at these big banks in Wall Street, they made off with hundreds of millions of dollars in severance benefits, and it turned out that being too big to fail also meant that those severance benefits were guaranteed by the full faith and credit of the United States government, and everybody in this room had to pull out their credit cards and pay for those benefits, right? 
Uh, because otherwise, if these firms go bankrupt, all these CEOs have to get in line with the rest of the unsecured creditors in bankruptcy, and they end up getting pennies on the dollar on their, their deferred benefits and their uh, severance packages, right? So I want you to imagine for a moment that you're the CEO of Chase Sachs, you've got the Treasury Secretary on your speed dial, and when you call him, he returns your call real quick, even if it means exiting a meeting at the White House with the President, because that is the reality if you look at Tim Geithner's logs, personal logs of what he's up to. Um, and you've got the President on a pretty short leash too, although to be, to be honest, I doubt the President gets back to you as fast as the Secretary of Treasury, Tim Geithner. So, okay, imagine that you are that person. What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? Because what you want, you're going to get. Because today, these are the most powerful economic titans in U.S. history. You want low taxes, and you want too big to fail. And you want too big to fail to be backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government with a triple A rating. That's really important to you. Because if you're backed by the United States government, full faith and credit of the United States government, and, and the United States government has a AAA rating, the credit rating agencies will give you a AAA rating. They will. They say that. They say that they will give you a higher rating if you're backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. So really, for a person like me, my only hope at ever being rated AAA is to hope that the United States government deems me too big to fail. Uh, that's not going to happen anytime soon. So okay, let's take a look at this from the point of view of Chase Sachs. What caused our debt problems? Well, basically, our debt problems were caused by exactly what I predicted you would want if you were the CEO of Chase Sachs. Um, the dark orange is the Bush tax cuts. That's contributing uh, a huge portion of our debt. About 25% uh, of our debt relative to GDP is the Bush tax cuts. 25%, you may recall that came up at the very beginning of this program. Someone in the audience raised their hand and said, well, what about the Bush tax cuts? And the comment was, well, you know, those aren't that big a deal. Something along those lines. I'd have to go review the transcript to get it perfect. But that was more or less it. You know, pay no attention to the Bush tax cuts. Well, let me be really clear. Pay lots of attention to the Bush tax cuts. They are a huge part of this problem. Uh, there was the war in Iraq, which turned out to be a frolic and detour. And so half of the light orange, at least, has to be attributed to that. Uh, and then there's the too big to fail banks and financial deregulation run amok. That's the blue. Now, there's been a lot of talk. Oh, it's all OK. We lent out this money, 500 billion there, 300 billion there, 600 billion over there, but it was all paid back. Well, as soon as they pay back the foregone GDP, then it'll all be paid back. As soon as they pay back the, the bailout of Fannie and Freddie, because most Fannie and Freddie mortgage paper is held by the banks, then it will be paid back. As soon as they pay out all the interest that we didn't get from making sweetheart loans to the financial sector, then it'll be paid back. That's basically the blue part of this chart. You'll see the TARP bailout, the Fannie, the Freddie bailout, uh, the economic downturn. All of that is because we had to allow banks uh, to run amok on Wall Street and crash global capitalism. So remember, Goldman Sachs, right? I'm sorry, Chase Sachs, the CEO of Chase Sachs. What do you want? You want low taxes and you want unlimited support for the financial sector. I recently did a mathematical exercise. It's on my blog. It's the Corporate Justice blog. I tried to calculate the total cost of banking run amok, this new uh, model of banking run amok, where we just let banks do whatever they want. And uh, if that means predatory lending or, or rolling the dice in the, in the derivatives casino, knock yourself out, go have fun. Don't worry, the Fed's going to clean up after you. And I came up with a, 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 a derivation of this. Foregone GDP, excess U.S. debt, and destroyed household wealth is the cost of that nonsense. Banking run amok, right? $19 trillion. As soon as Wall Street writes a check to the American people for $19 trillion, then I will stand by calmly and listen to all the experts explain how it was all paid back and everyone should be happy and don't worry, just smile. 
Uh, but until we see that $19 trillion check, this financial crisis was an unmitigated financial catastrophe on our federal budget deficit. And by the way, $19 trillion actually exceeds the total outstanding debt of the United States government. So the costs inflicted on the American people from the financial crisis exceeds the total outstanding debt of the United States. So okay, uh, this is a slide that uh, Dre just showed. And I wanna highlight, you know, again, I'm CEO of Chase Sachs. This is beautiful. I love this. In fact, we need to get this lower. How about we just abolish Social Security, I don't need it, abolish Medicare, and cut my taxes by another half, like we did in the 19, from 1960 to 2004. I would be very happy with that. We need austerity, man. Uh, so from 1960 to 2004, the very wealthiest and most powerful among us, probably no one in this room, there's not 10,000 people in this room, 0.01% is one in 10,000. If you are in this room, come see me after the lecture and we'll talk about how I can help you uh, <laughs> as your lawyer. Uh, but, but for the most part, we're talking about huge tax cuts for the most powerful among us to a huge extent. And remember, in the 60s, in the 90s, uh, in the 70s to some extent, in the 50s when the Eisenhower administration insisted on 91% marginal tax rates, we saw the golden era of American prosperity. Uh, you can go back and look at the numbers yourself. Uh, it's not as if these higher levels of taxes in the 60s and 50s harmed us economically. We grew like gangbusters. It was an economic miracle. So, okay, uh, this is two charts that are really meaningful. One is uh, inequality measured by the top 1%. It peaked right before the Great Depression, and it peaked again right before the Great Recession in 2008. And that makes perfect sense to me because what happens when you get too much of your wealth in too few hands is that the cost for collective action to lobby Congress to persuade lawmakers and regulators, plunge. And so you can subvert law and regulation for profit. You can rig markets so no matter how stupid you are, no matter how dumb the lo loans are that you're extending, no matter how silly the risks are that you take in the derivatives market, you get bailed out by the government, right? Does that sound familiar? Well, we saw that right before the Great Depression, and we saw it again in 2008. Those with hyper-concentrated wealth have an enhanced ability to subvert law and regulation and to rig capitalism itself. And as a consequence, we end up paying for their folly. Uh, now notice the flip side here. Marginal tax rates at the very high levels during the 50s and 60s when our debt problems almost disappeared were associated with very low inequality. That's this period right here, the 50s and 60s, the post-World War II economic boom, low inequality, high marginal tax rates, right? Does it get any more simple than this graph? Um, and there it is again. This is debt. This is debt. When did debt plunge? Eisenhower. You see that red Eisenhower up there? Debt plunged. Eisenhower. What were marginal tax rates? Top marginal tax rates were 91%. Inequality plunged and debt plunged. And we had prosperity that we'd never seen in our history before, the 50s and 60s. Anyone know who that is? That's Mariano Rajoy. He's uh, the Prime Minister of Spain. And this is a press conference in early June. This is a press conference in early June of 2012. And I was in Spain when this press conference occurred. And it was remarkable. Because Spain, it's all about austerity over there in Spain, right? Europe, austerity in Greece, austerity in Italy. He's announcing a $125 billion bailout for the banks. Austerity. 
$125 billion in bailouts for Spain for the banks, right? Who wins? Well, I would posit Chase Sachs wins because the derivatives market ties all these banks together. And once these banks start falling like nine pins, your guess is as good as mine about who ends up with the losses. But in the final analysis, the Fed is going to clean up the mess. That's what's going to happen. So the austerity, this is the face of austerity in Spain. And it's a $125 billion bailout for their banks, okay? This is also the face of austerity. This is Madrid. Uh, my wife took this picture. Uh, we were in Madrid when protests broke out in June because they're firing teachers, they're firing firefighters, they're firing uh, police officers, they're cutting back on medical care for everyone, they're privatizing their education system. And just in case you don't recognize this part of Spain, this street where you see this line of people, this, this sea of people end, stops in Plaza Mayor, which is where that's like point zero in Spain. That's the main place in Madrid, right? I don't know how many people were at this protest, but I could look down uh, Paseo de Prado, which goes to the Prado Museum, if you've ever been to Madrid, or I could look towards Plaza Mayor. This is where we're standing. And you see this sea of people endlessly in both ways. So what's the upshot here? What's my point? I know what austerity is about. Austerity is about people like you and me paying so that the banks can take huge risks in the derivatives markets, so that the banks can make very silly loans, uh, very silly loans, the silliest loans in history, according to OCC chair uh, John Dugan, right? Uh, so if you want austerity, this is what you get. This is the economic growth. Everybody says, oh, austerity, it's going to help us economically. Uh, this is where austerity has taken the nations of Spain, uh, the nations of Europe that have followed the prescriptions of the austerians. This is where they've gone. They're still not anywhere near where GDP was in 2008. Unemployment has soared to over 25%. That's, that's a much greater level of unemployment than the United States has seen. And in terms of GDP, we're actually ahead of the game compared to where we were in 2008. So think about this chart. The United States is growing again. And think about this chart. And then ask yourself whether or not you're going to go in for the uh, austerian scam as a way to solve economic problems. Uh, again, US growth, no austerity yet. European nightmare, austerity. Um, so remember the 300 billion, 500 billion, 600 billion here and there? Uh, well, Bloomberg sued the Fed to get information on exactly how much lending we're talking about. And the GAO did an investigation on how much lending we did and who got the loans. And this is the, this is the bottom line finding. And way here at the bottom corner here, it amounted to a total amount of lending of $16 trillion. Total loans of $16 trillion. That's an astounding sum, right? Um, and who got the loans? Well, Citigroup, they were, they were so insolvent. They were so nightmarishly insolvent. They should have been shut down. Uh, Morgan Stanley, probably the same. Morgan Lynch got bought up. Uh, Merrill Lynch got bought up. Morgan Lynch. Uh, Merrill Lynch got bought up by Bank of America. Barclays. That's the United Kingdom's problem, right? No, it's the Fed's problem. Uh, Royal Bank of Scotland. Isn't that a Glasgow thing? No, that's the Fed's problem. USBAG, Switzerland. Uh, credit. We didn't just prop up the United States financial system. We propped up the entire world financial system. And we probably just should have let it all go down the tubes and nationalize the banks like they did in Sweden in the 1990s. And Sweden had a much less severe financial crisis than either Europe or the United States. So uh, yeah. If I'm the CEO of Chase Sachs, 
I want to keep this in place, and Dodd-Frank largely does keep this in place. Why do I want to keep this in place if I'm the CEO of uh, Chase Sachs? Well, look, I got maybe a couple of trillion bucks in assets, but I'm playing in the derivatives market to the tune of almost 100 trillion bucks at the top end of this chart, right? So how is it that my counterparties, because, because remember, derivatives, over-the-counter derivatives are nothing more than very complicated contracts. Two parties enter into a contract, make it really complicated so no one can figure it out, and then let the, let the dice fall where they may. So you end up with a couple of trillion in assets and 70 trillion in, in derivatives. Yes, I must have the full faith and credit of the government behind me so that my counterparties are willing to enter into these transactions. So yes, the CEO of Chase Sachs, he wants austerity so that the United States can do better in terms of its credit rating so that they can continue to play in the derivatives market. And by the way, they're bigger than ever. Uh, this is the, the five largest banks in 2006. This is the five largest banks in 2008. So, so this idea that too big to fail is over is just false. They have more economic power now than ever. And they're going to have the economy over the barrel, just like they did in 2008, if we run into heavy weather again. Um, so, okay, to wrap this all up, uh, this is, again, the 0.01% most uh, wealthy. And you can see, again, the two spikes, one before the Great Depression, one before the Great Recession of 2008. The problem in both cases is, separate apart from social justice concerns, once you get too much wealth concentrated in too few hands, your law and regulatory system will be subverted by those people. They will rig capitalism so that it only works for them and everyone else has to pay for their folly, which is exactly our reality today. So I make this argument in my recent book that just came out called Lawless Capitalism. That is the thesis of lawless capitalism. Uh, and I'll be happy to share any information or answer any questions about any of this at this email address. Um, but basically what lawless capitalism does is it catalogs law by law and regulation by regulation exactly how banking and financial elites corrupted our legal regulatory system in the lead up to the crisis of 2008. That is the thesis of this book. Uh, now, since then it's gotten worse. Since then, the DOJ has announced that not only are these financial elites entitled to dominate law and regulation for their benefit, but they're above the law in terms of criminal misconduct. So that the, the DOJ announced on December 12th that they're not going to bring any kind of criminal charges against, for example, HSBC for massive money laundering. So I'll stop there with this, with this last idea that... Um, yeah, we should reform entitlements, no doubt about it. But we need to pay more in taxes, especially at the top end. We need to get the banks under control, and we need to do something to keep elites from dominating law and regulation. So thank you.